All right. Sorry. Still getting set up. I got distracted doing my makeup. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> so how's your Sunday going so far? It's okay. Yeah. I sent Jake and William out on a hike. So <laughs> you're like, get out of here. Yeah, so I didn't get a chance to rewatch, but I was kind of like watching some behind the scenes stuff from Rick. And um, it's kind of funny how people say Dior, um, the girl who plays Clarice is like, would be the most likely to cry at the end of Camp Half Blood. Like, it's, it's really funny. And I know you've said before, like Leah says she's not exactly Annabeth in her personality either. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, <laughs> just that these kids are so good. You would never realize they're playing the opposite of their personalities. Yeah. Dior is, I think it's funny that Dior has an Aries moon. <laughs> she has it like on her profile. She has her astrology, like on her TikTok profile. So she could definitely lean into that when playing Clarice, but she's like a very like creatively minded person. And I think it's cute that they're like, yeah, she would. The other thing they said of behind the scenes stuff is that if she pulled a prank on them, she would tell them that it was her. <laughs> and I'm like, OK, so she's definitely not like like lethal at all, like Clarice. <laughs> yeah, Clarice is I. I just remembered how scary it is where um like when we get to the capture the flag scene and she's ambushing him and he's talking about glory she's like screw glory i want vengeance and that is just so crazy because we see all the other kids also chasing their chaos but she's just like given up on it i guess i don't know she I almost feel like she doesn't care because of how horrible Aries is. Yeah. Um, like he is like canonically abusive. I don't think like the like physically abusive. Like I don't know if I don't think any of the other gods are physically abusive. Um, not that I can remember right now anyway, but he is. And that just makes it even yeah, you're not going to care that much <laughs> about that stuff. And that's, it's funny because Clarice and Percy end up becoming like weird friends, like later on, um, as soon as they get over their stuff pretty much in Sea of Monsters, like they're never going to be like best friends forever, but they definitely respect each other a lot in the later books because they, I think they understand that about each other in a weird way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So i was also thinking about like with aries so the depiction of him as a biker um i love that but i was thinking there's a better choice that they could have made they could have still had him on a motorcycle but they should have made him a police officer oh god yes <laughs> yes the untapped rage like i i kind of get where they were coming from where um like if we were talking D D alignments a biker is more likely to be chaotic, you know, like chaotic evil. But um, I mean, we've seen what police officers do. At best, they are e neutral evil, you know, uh, yeah. because they can circumvent the law in their own ways. So, yeah. Jesus. Yeah. Maybe they'll do that with him later on, but or make him something different next time. But that is yeah that would make a lot of sense that's basically kind of what he's like like the god version of that is like a police officer that you don't know what he's ever going to do yeah. he could do literally anything to you and you're just kind of watching him like please don't kill me that's basically literally what he is what he's like because he just doesn't care yeah, well, like with Aries, I mean, so I don't think of biker dudes as being big and scary. And I don't know if that's just like me, but I I feel like there's more examples of biker dudes. Like, isn't there a group of, of guys who would go around and like when 
Westboro Baptist Church, for example, with like picket funerals, they would go and like stand in the way so that the mourners yeah. didn't have to see them. So like, and I think there's also bikers that will stay outside of like hospitals for like abuse victim kids and like. Uh, Angels. I think that's the group that does that. Yeah. Um, I'm def I'm not afraid of bikers at all because I, I live in Wisconsin and for anyone who doesn't know, there's Harley Davidson is from here. Um, every summer we have Harley Fest where for like a week, bikers just take over like they're just everywhere and it's honestly kind of stressful when you drive because you don't want to hit any of them and they're just every there's like just that like 20 30 40 thousand like bikers just everywhere you go and so i don't think that they're scary i feel like that's like a older stereotype that like a gen x person like rick riordan would would lean on because there was that stereotype about bikers before in like the 80s and 90s that they were like troublesome or whatever but people don't see people who wear like leather jackets and have tattoos as like the bad people anymore. Yeah, yeah, it's so <laughs> weird how that has changed. And like, yeah, exactly. Rick's generation is probably party, partly playing a part in that choice, but also him being like, I imagine him being more of a scrawny academic dude in his youth, you know? Yes. So um, yeah, I could see him being intimidated by big biker dudes. Yeah, uh, if you wanna get an idea of Rick Riordan, um, Every once in a while, I see like posts on Instagram of people posting just funny things he used to say on his Instagram, or he still posts every once in a while. And there was one from the before the Super Bowl this year where they were at, and it was, you know, the whole weirdness with like Taylor Swift. And it was him posting that he was a Swifty and that he, and he's mentioned Taylor Swift in Percy Jackson somewhere before. So that's not too surprising, but it was him saying, I have never watched football a day in my life, but go Kansas City Chiefs. <laughs> and so, yeah, that's definitely somewhat from him. <laughs> oh my gosh. He is a treasure. He really is. He really is. <laughs> Yeah, when I saw that, I every time I see that, people are like, oh, that's why Percy's like, like I remember when that the show first started, people were I I saw like a funny like tweet or whatever that was like, you know, when people say like all it's not all men, they're like, yes, you're correct. Percy Jackson would never do that, <laughs> and, and that's like coming from Rick, and I'm like, it's good to know like where that came from. That a guy that doesn't care about masculinity like that <laughs> is writing a character like that no wonder why he's like that yeah yeah and yeah that's a good point because like it's not a female written male character too that's such a big a big point in this especially because he's yeah. as far as i know cis hetero like he has a wife and kids right yep he's been with his wife since he was 16. so he's very like straight white dude he grew up in texas um you wouldn't think that he would be how he is, but he just is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that probably makes sense to a lot of his choices. What's his sun sign? Gemini. <laughs> he's a Gemini sun, Aries moon. Okay. Which I think is so funny that he's an Aries moon because Percy is a walking Aries moon. <laughs> yes. Canonically Leo, too. I actually just mm -hmm. found that one out. <laughs> Yep. Yeah, there's a line because there's a character named Leo in Heroes of Olympus where he's like, oh, I'm a Leo. And he's like, and Leo's like, no, I'm Leo. <laughs> and I'm like, shut up, dude. <laughs> um, What was I going to say about this? About this? There's so much to say about this episode because there's so much really good stuff happening in it. Um, I don't even know where to start. <laughs> Yeah, because we have the stuff going on with Ares, and then we have the adventure that, like, the little mini quest they're sent on. Mm -hmm. And um, both parts are so well done. I mean, um, Rick even said himself in an interview, he was glad that they finally did the water ride. And, like, the water ride was probably one of the best parts, um, yes. other than Arian calling out Ares. <laughs> <laughs> or yeah, well, I guess one thing we can say is um, because they changed a lot of the tunnel of love, how it happens in the book, like in the book, they go through the ride and they have, and they get attacked basically by this trap that Hephaestus left for Ares and um, 
Aphrodite, but they get stuck in it anyway, and they get attacked by a bunch of spiders. So, of course, Annabeth freaks out because she's obviously scared of spiders. And um, Percy has to basically, like, get them through the ride because she can't do anything. She's too, she's too scared. But they get through it, and they come back. But this one, I remember them talking about behind-the-scenes stuff that it was just way, it would have been way too expensive to like make all those spiders like they would have had to make them like virtually and then the actors would have had to like pretend like they were being attacked by a bunch of that would have been really weird um the way that they did it is like 57 million times better <laughs> like i i like defy somebody to say that the book version of the tunnel of love is better than what we got like you have to be insane <laughs> to say that um, but I just wanted to bring that up that that's why that's where like the idea of why they changed the scene came from and they definitely I think improved on it a lot yeah so did they go with the net in the books it's been a while since I've read that one I don't remember I still remember that all I remember is all of the spiders attacking them and that Percy grabs like they find like Aphrodite's scarf when they're in there that shows that they were there and that Aerie sent them back to like get his um to get his thing because he was too much of a bitch baby to go get it himself basically but like they were being attacked and it was dangerous but it wasn't as dangerous as the whole chair thing is like there is danger and they were and you were afraid for them but it it wasn't quite as scary as you thought that they were about to die yeah. um so this one was actually kind of worse in that way that Ares didn't tell them anything and just was like, yeah, yeah, sure. Go get my shield. <laughs> oh, one thing I wanted to say that I always like about this episode is how they show Annabeth like figuring out mechanical things that like when first off the fact that Annabeth is not scared at all of Ares <laughs> um, when they're when he's yelling at them and she's just like, Am I supposed to be afraid of you? But when they get to like Waterworld, that she is the one that figures out the little thing when they're entering in that Percy is afraid of. And then when, and she's the one that figures out that the thing that they're looking at must be like a, like a machine of some sort and they have to figure it out, um, which makes Percy remember what it is. And then of course, when Percy has gone, she is sitting there thinking that she can figure out how to fix a chair that was made by a god to the point that she yells at Hephaestus because she's like so thinking about it so hard that she's like get away from me and doesn't even think about the fact that he's Hephaestus <laughs> that like a random dude just showed up telling her how to get out of this place when they know that Hephaestus knows that they're there it doesn't even occur to her and she just yells at him <laughs> um because she's so like I need to fix this I just like that they I like how they show that, that about how she can figure this stuff out um, and that like side of her personality that's purely just about Annabeth. <laughs> yeah, this is a big scene for Annabeth. And so I think replacing it with the chair is, um, so the chair has a lot to do with the whole Aries, Aphrodite, Hephaestus love triangle in that like, Hephaestus built that as a punishment for Hera for not being a loving mom, essentially. And so um, he is literally the only person able to break her out of it. Everybody else tries and it gets to the point that Zeus has to offer up a reward for whoever can get her out. Mm -hmm. And Aphrodite ends up being the reward thinking like, oh, Ares has got this. That's fine. But Hephaestus, um, I guess he storms him, probably trying to get Hephaestus to tell him the secret. And Hephaestus chases him out, chases him out of his forge. And then um, Dionysus comes and gets him drunk and convinces him, like, no, you should go up and then maybe they'll give you Aphrodite. So that's how they ended up married. And um, so we know from mythology, Hephaestus is literally the only person that can get them out of this. And this trap is so strong that multiple gods could not break it. So, I mean, the fact that Percy's mortal little body ends up trapped in it is really terrifying when you think yeah. about it. Yeah, it's like legitimately terrifying. And I know we want to talk about Grover, obviously, in this episode, because he's amazing. But 
one comparison I thought of this time when I was watching the episode today is how Percy also tricks Annabeth into like he he doesn't like full on manipulate her but he definitely tricks her into like letting letting her be the letting him be the one to go in the chair because she does obviously she doesn't want to but he brings up the thing that she know that he knows will like she'll there's no way she can argue against this like you do know more than me and so this is like the one thing that he knows that he can get her to give in and do it and of course she panics right afterwards <laughs> but i just kind of love that that he is like using what he knows about her to get what he wants um it's a very abuse kid thing to do <laughs> to like know people enough to know like kind of like their weak points and use it to get what you need even if that thing you think you need is trapping yourself into a chair that's going to slowly suffocate you to death <laughs> so um in most of the tellings that chair is gold but in one of them i had to look this i was i was reading it with william last night while we were i was putting him to bed and um one of the tellings has the chair made out of animate which is like a mythological or it does not exist because when i was reading that i was like asking william what color is that and of course because he plays hella video games he's like it's green <laughs> and i was like what <laughs> so you know i look it up and it's like oh yeah this is mythological fictional i feel like that could have been an interesting choice but of course gold is more flashy and um you wouldn't have to explain to the viewers what it is if if you do gold um but that could have been another interesting way to do it is just have like a completely new metal that these kids are not familiar with be the thing trapping them yeah yeah I don't even know what to say about that, that the, I always think about the chair scenes. I'm like, this is absurd. Like just acting wise, I was like blown away by both of them. Um, Walker Scobell deserves like some sort of award for how he handles when he like starts sitting in it. And then he's waiting for when it starts happening. And especially when Annabeth starts panicking because Annabeth never panics ever and she is yelling at him to get up when he literally can't move and just his face when he's trying to convince her that he's okay when he just keeps saying i'm okay when he's obviously not and you can see on his face that he's also panicking but he's just trying to act like he's fine i was just like jesus christ <laughs> that is way better than i expected out of like a, a couple kids like that's that's ridiculous <laughs> yeah <laughs> that scene it's really really heart wrenching like all of it and yeah. i can't wait for more hephaestus i mean we've yeah. talked about this too because we both watched psych that it's lassie who plays yeah. it's, it's an interesting choice and i wish we saw more of him because i feel like i could see him playing it well it's like this guy who wants to believe in love and goodness and that things can can be better but he keeps constantly getting beaten back like legitimately he will reach out for affection to his his olympian family and they'll laugh at him as he's limping around and serving them like yeah, yeah. But this time i thought it was interesting how when he first starts talking to annabeth and she's like go away um he gets all mad at her like i'm not easily pushed aside i'm like are you afraid of a 12 year old girl <laughs> like you're a god why are you yelling at a 12 year old girl but it's it's that whole like trauma thing of him being like i'm not i'm not that weak everyone treats me like i'm weak but i'm not actually that weak i'm just not like a monster like the rest of my siblings are <laughs> i like actually care about you know some of the kids like i love how he apologizes to Annabeth for Athena. Like he says, like, I know she can be a lot, but that was, he's like, that was a lot. <laughs> like, and it just shows like, even from like one of the gods, they're like, yeah, that was too much that she just left you guys there at the arch and everything that kind of shows just like, even to a God, they're like, yeah, that was way too mean. And like, how bad do you have to be where one of your God siblings are even like, what is wrong with you <laughs> yeah <laughs> and uh but yeah what was i gonna say about this episode with hephaestus um 
I don't know. There's just the whole thing, the whole like difference of Hephaestus and Aries in this episode is just like, what is going on? <laughs> like when, when Percy gets out of the chair, he, one of my favorite like little acting things from that is that he, he can't even like stand up really right yet, but he tries to like stand in front of Annabeth to protect her from Hephaestus because he doesn't know that Hephaestus is Hephaestus, but he also doesn't know that Hephaestus is nice. He doesn't know that he just helped her. And so he's like afraid and is trying to protect her because most of the time when they run into God so far, they've needed to be protected. And it's just, this is like the one God where he doesn't have to do that. And then they go back to Ares that, <sighs> That is just treating them like less than anything that any of them deserve. He's just horrible. And it's especially horrible to think that everything Ares does in this episode is just so he can give them the backpack so that they so that he will end up with the the lightning bolt in his backpack when he gets sucked into Tartarus. Yeah. That's the only reason he does any of this stuff. So I don't think he even cares if they die. Um if I'm Aries, because he's so angry and that anger and like the fact that he thinks that no one can ever beat him makes him stupid. <laughs> um, he probably assumed that Annabeth would be the one to like be stuck in the trap and that Percy would be fine. Like, I honestly wonder like what his face would have looked like if Annabeth couldn't get Percy out and she came back by herself. He would have been like, damn it. <laughs> Like, my, our entire, like, Kronos would have, like, annihilated him in that moment just alone. But I'm sure it would have shocked him to know that Percy was the one that was in there and not the other way around. Um, but it's just, like, one of them is so easy to manipulate because he's so angry that he doesn't even think that these kids could possibly know more than he does. And the other one is like treating them nicely and is like, I'm sorry that you got trapped in my golden chair that was meant for my abusive mother. Yeah. <laughs> and like, you know, pretty quickly gives in and lets them out once he realizes like, yeah, what am I doing? Yeah. Like this kid is doesn't deserve this fate. What? No. <laughs> yeah, he's the one God who really would. And that's such a good choice. Um, he's so we talked about the difference between him and Ares, but the difference between him and Athena, that is like, they're supposed to be opposites. And mm -hmm. I know Rick has Zeus as uh, Hephaestus's father, but he's supposed to be born of Athena, or sorry, born of Hera alone. Like Athena is born from Zeus alone. And um, like, you know, you have the contrast of we have a woman going to battle and a man who is not fit for battle at all. If we're, um, like, I, it, I could not find a depiction of what his his disability would look like, other than, like, one base painting where they have him have a really curved, clubbed foot. Um, but, yeah, he's supposed to be, like, completely weak from the waist down and um, can't even walk right, and that's part of why he gets laughed at. So, Ares would reject him, you know, just because Ares is a dick and he, lo he wants his wife, but... Athena probably rejects him, similar to that one scene in the 300, where there's that guy that wants to fight. This is actually in, like, Greek text, so I should know the names. I don't. Um, but Leonidas is talking to this one disabled dude who wants to fight, and he's like, we have to hold up these huge shields. Can you hold this? And basically rejects him that way of, you are physically not able to do the things we need you to do to be able to participate in a phalanx, to, like um you know go out there and carry a sword so sorry and i feel like that's how athena probably approaches hephaestus is like you are not physically fit to do you know like battle so i don't respect you in a way even if you do make this great armor for our battles they definitely look at him as like weak or like less than which is the whole thing with annabeth's speech in this episode is like they see that as a bad thing, but that's actually a really good thing. Um, that kind of goes with what they talk about, even with Percy Jackson, like, um, well, the third book, when they decide to meet and decide if Percy should be killed by them or not, um, Hephaestus is one of the gods that thinks that he should live. And Athena is like being a hardcore bitch and thinks that he should die. 
And so I'm sure that that just like went in line with what she thought he would say. Like, oh, of course you want this kid to live because you're too weak to like see how bad of a problem he is or whatever. Um, but I mean, Hephaestus would want somebody like Percy in this world and realize that he's like desperately needed. Yeah. Yeah, he's breaking the generational trauma. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, actually, someone who has been like liking all of my Percy videos in the last like couple days, he, I think it's a he, sorry if you're not, <laughs> sent me this amazing like TikTok edit where it looked like the person who made it like wrote like almost like a, like a poem. I'll, I'm going to try to remember to send it to you when we're done because it's really, it like made me cry when I watched it. And I keep watching because it's just very like effective, but it's basically like a poem from like Annabeth's point of view, basically saying like Percy is, it's called like, let him be soft. And like the last lines of the poem is like, you have heroes like Achilles and Hercules and Icarus, and you have all these heroes, you can make them anytime you want. And she, it basically ends with her saying like, let him be soft and let him be mine. And I'm like, yeah, that's, that's literally their entire dynamic is like, she wants him to be different. And it, like this episode is when she really, really like gets slapped in the face with it when she realizes that he might die. And she's like, no. <laughs> um, but that's like their whole dynamic in one is like, Percy really needs somebody like that. Because um, Annabeth is so like, tough. <laughs> Like, you know, she doesn't really show emotion very much. People talk about, talk to her as if she doesn't really have feelings a lot of the time, or she's just kind of dealing with stuff in a way where she's more like adult like that. Like that's her kind of role. And she, and like Percy and her don't work like that. Like she has to actually show feelings around him and she wants to, and he like lets her because he's not like this. He doesn't want to be like one of the heroes, like, the rest of the people want him to be. And so I love that TikTok. It made me cry a lot because I'm like, yeah, that's what it really is. It's like, first you need somebody like Annabeth who will like kind of basically protect him. Like she, he, he would never survive this sort of like kill or be killed society when he is not like that at all um, without somebody like her, like helping him when he gets like overwhelmed by the things that people are expecting him to do. And it's why they work so well and why they are how they are because she helps him. She will she will fucking cut you and kill you if you push him too hard or if you're mean to him or like are asking him to do things that he shouldn't be able to do. She will yell at you even if you're Hera. She will freaking scream at you. Um, and so it's like, she doesn't care and he needs somebody like that. And she's willing to do that because he helps her with her own, like she, he lets, she, tr he treats her like, she's like a real person in a way, almost like, not like this, not this like authority figure. And everyone else kind of looks to her as if she knows the answers to everything. And he knows that she knows a lot, but it's not, it's a completely different dynamic. And it was really sweet seeing that and then watching that episode being like, yeah, that's that's literally what they do. And it's so satisfying to watch them get to that point because the way that they interact with each other after this episode is completely different. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely getting to that, like, that point where they actually like each other and want to be around each other. Because before we have Annabeth being super tentative, like, mm -hmm. well, there's this prophecy, you're going to die. So I guess I can't get that close. And then we have Percy just like, I have no idea what this girl is about or like how she actually feels about me. So I'm just going to keep a little distance. <laughs> yeah, like one of my favorite um, little cute little scenes from this episode that's a very abuse kid thing too is when Percy first gets out of the water and they find him alive and she hugs him but he's like expecting her to hit him yeah. <laughs> and he's like desperately trying to explain why he why he pushed her down the stairs and he's like I'm really sorry that I did that I didn't mean to I just I knew that you would never 
be okay with it and there wasn't enough time and he's like panicking <laughs> before she gets up there and then he's like oh she likes me <laughs> like she's she's not mad at me she's like giving me a hug what does this mean no one has ever been nice to me like this before what am i doing <laughs> it's very sweet <laughs> It's super cute. Yeah, that one is so cute. And that's like the very first scene in this episode, right? Mm -hmm. Percy is such a be an abused fr freaking kid in this episode. I like don't even know how to handle it because from the fact that his dad acknowledged his existence one time and then that makes him like immediately like be invested in what they're doing in a way that they weren't before. And all of a sudden he's like realizing that their quest doesn't make any sense from what they know. And the other two are like, yeah, we figured this out like before we left. And he didn't because he just didn't care. He just wanted to get his mom back. But he just, his dad wasn't even there. <laughs> but that's enough to get him to be like, oh, I care about this world now. Yeah. <laughs> because it's like, oh, my dad acknowledged that I'm alive. And he like didn't let me die from being poisoned or falling off of the St. Louis Arch or both at the same time. So now I'm like ready to like fight whoever I need to to stay in this world because my dad gave me three seconds of attention. Yeah, yeah, such an abuse kid thing. <laughs> I'm just like, okay, well, okay. And then um, the stuff with Aries, especially too, was, uh, it's just, I get, I, I know I told you this before we started, but I get so bothered when people try to say that like Gabe isn't that bad in this version. Not only because in this episode, he has to sit there and watch him on TV, like accuse him of murdering his mother and say that he's a messed up kid and, and has like the FBI are like looking for him and he's all over the news and he's, that is making what they're trying to do harder. Um, it's bad enough that he has to sit there and do that when and like Grover and Annabeth are ha are like watching that. That's I know exactly how embarrassing that is yeah. when like people that you're friends with are seeing like how horrible your abusive parent is and you really don't want them to. But you're just sitting there watching and you're like, OK, this is um, horrible. Uh, great. <laughs> um, and then especially because after that happens, Aries starts screaming at them about like, I, th I think the line he says is something like, if you guys don't do this, I'll just like kill you right here and now, like something like that. But um, he looks scared when Aries starts yelling at him. And yeah, it's not the like the, it's like actually how abused kids act in the way that he like looks away, like he doesn't look at him when he's yelling. And you can tell that he just looks a little bit scared in the way that the other two aren't. Um, and it's not like over the top, but that's how you actually are when you are used to being abused. You're not going to like fall apart when somebody starts screaming at you because you're used to it. It's like scary still to you, but it's not like a new experience for you either. But he is affected by what Aries says, and you can clearly see it on Walker's face that he is. It's not like over the top. So I feel like people just don't think it's that big of a deal, um, which is annoying as hell. <laughs> but that is, that's definitely a, a part of this episode. And it's like frustrating to watch. <laughs> the way that I've always read Percy's character is the idea that like, if you tell a kid they're a bad kid enough, they're gonna act like a bad kid. And that's why we get the witty sarcasm rather than like, you know, a beaten down, I don't know, abused kid. It's it's more because he's like, okay, you guys already think I'm bad, so what else, What you know, like, am I just gonna not say anything? Um, I might as well say the thing and get in trouble anyway. And, yeah, and it's also a thing of like, it's that like self-destructive streak of like, you expect me to be bad. It doesn't matter that I'm not, but I also kind of believe that I am because I've heard it so much and so many people think that I am and I'm so mad. And at some point you just get tired of, of like not saying what's going through your mind and you just like say it, even though you know it's kind of self-destructive, like him yelling at Aries at the end of the episode, like Grover is telling him to stop and he knows it's not a good idea, but he's gonna do it anyway. Cause he's like this, freaking god sent me somewhere and i almost died and he doesn't even care 
so he's just going to yell at him because he's tired of it. Um, that's very much something that you do because you just get tired of never saying what you're thinking. Eventually, you just like don't care enough that even though you're still scared, you just are tired and you almost like want them. There's like a whole thing with abuse like that where you get tired of waiting for something to happen. Mm -hmm. And so you just kind of are trying to like almost bait them into a reaction because it, I rather just do that instead of just wait for them to decide because the waiting is the worst part, honestly, of like waiting for them to react to something. Um, and that's very much what he's doing there. Like he's like, I don't, I don't care if the God of War could literally smite me right now. I'm still going to yell at him because I'm tired of this nonsense. Yeah. It's so what I find interesting too is we have Sally teaching him about Greek mythology super early on. So it's not like he doesn't know the rules. As much as this is a new world to him, it's not like he doesn't know that really all the gods care about is fear and that you sacrifice your portion to them at your meals. Like they just want their altars attended to. And so he would he would actually know these people want me to suck up to them. But how many people do we think that Percy has met like that in his life so far, having changed schools so often, having mm -hmm. dealt with Gabe? Like, I mean, he's done. He's he's already had to do that. Yeah, it's like, I don't care that you want me to suck up to you because you're like the five millionth person in my life that I've met that wants the thing about being a kid that's going through an abusive situation at home is that I don't know how else to say it, but that you feel like everyone else is really stupid um, because it's very obvious to you what is going on and nobody else seems to notice. And you're like, is everyone else just like brain dead? Like I can literally remember thinking things like that when I was at school and just being so mad, like, is everyone stupid? Like everyone has to be stupid because this is the most obvious thing in the entire world. How could nobody else but me notice what is going on? And there's obviously more to do with than that. But like when you're a kid going through it, you don't care. You're just like, everyone is an idiot. <laughs> and so when you have like people in authority that are that, especially when people tell you like, oh, go to your teachers if you need help, or if something is going on, you can come to us and talk to us about it. And it's like, I know that you're lying because you don't notice anything. And times when I do try to say things, you don't seem to realize what I'm saying. So why would I, why would I listen to you? And that's very much like Percy's perspective too, is like, yeah, the gods are just another thing that people say you're supposed to pray to them and they'll help you. But by this point, even in the story, he's already seen that that doesn't work all the time. And so like, why would he, he already doesn't think that they'll do it. And then they, they prove to him that they won't. So like, after that, it's especially like, why would I ever believe anything you say ever again? Or like, why would I play your rules when, even when like, even when Annabeth does, you still like leave her, like leave us. So like, why would I bother? <laughs> And, like, and what was Annabeth supposed to do? I mean, what was Athena expecting Annabeth to do? Like, physically stop him? Sure, she maybe could have, but how? Like, do you want her to yeah. take him out? Do you want her to use the head on him? Like, Well, and especially, like, the whole thing with, like, Medusa's head is, like, okay, what were they supposed to do with this head that can literally kill anybody who looks at it? They can't just leave it there for somebody else to find. If they sent it to camp... I don't know how they could put something on it before somebody at camp would open it and like be turned into stone and they wouldn't send it to camp like that unless they were could be sure that no one at camp would like open it up or something or something but like or but it's also a thing of like no matter how angry you are right now nobody knows about this like the only people that know that this happened is percy and grover and annabeth and like hermes and so it's like nobody, this isn't like a public display of like, it's not one of the times where he like openly just defies gods and yells at them in front of other, uh, in front of other like campers or whatever at camp. Nobody else knows besides your siblings and your daddy, like that this happened. 
And so the only reason you're being so hard on your daughter is because you you feel embarrassed because your family knows that you suck as a mom. <laughs> and because it's just like, nobody knows that they even did this. So why are you so ashamed? It doesn't, maybe it's because like, could you maybe realize that no matter how many times you suck up to your abusive father, he will never help you? Could you maybe figure that out? and like that could be helpful but no she she never gets there ever yeah well I mean I think canonically Athena uses Medusa's head on her shield so uh, was she expecting to get it back I don't know if, if the monsters regenerate does that mean that she already still has it or I don't know how that works either but I'm pretty sure Medusa's head is on her aegis and um I think there's probably heroes who borrow it as well if I remember correctly. But, um, I mean, I don't, why would Percy give it to her? I mean, they could have used it on their journey, but then they risk it being used against themselves if it's constantly near them. Or, I mean, you peek in the bag the wrong way, the hat slips off in the bag or something, if you were to keep it in the bag, yeah. So there's probably not a good way to carry around a severed head that you can't look at. Yeah, like they didn't have that many options and no matter how mad you were at him i'm not sure that the correct response is they should all die yeah because it's literally like it's like a it's honestly like a miracle that they all didn't in st louis um oh because literally the hero killer countless heroes that we don't know about because if you don't survive you don't get your clay eyes have yeah. fallen to it i mean not echidna to chimera and so yeah she was literally she knew what she was doing and like one thing i just remembered about this episode about like them going in percy going in the chair is like the fates literally are there saying that one of them is gonna die so uh i feel like it's an important point to make that if annabeth didn't find a way to get him out of that chair he would have died yeah. and it, that's not like a you know, a funny joke, like when they're talking before they go in, he's literally not expecting to live like he looks surprised when it starts going away again. Um, and so it's like he doesn't expect to survive after that point. He thinks he's just saying goodbye to her for good. Like, in fact, he gives like Riptide and stuff to her and he doesn't expect to live after that. And he's like, yeah, that's fine, because I don't think I don't think that you need me in order to like win this quest and it's like oh my jesus christ <laughs> that, that could not be less true but that's i feel like that's an important point to make when you consider like aries in this episode that he was gonna die and it's just like a miracle that he doesn't which aries is probably really angry about to this day <laughs> yeah i mean it checks out but it's harder it's harder reality to deal with in percy jackson and the olympians so like when you think of the Trojan War, we literally have the gods playing with people's lives. Massive casualties over 10 years, you know, literally going into battle with them, pretending to be certain soldiers on either side or going in with their chariots and their spears. Um, Ares doing so as mostly indifferent, but, you know, fighting on the Trojan side because he's getting some booty from Aphrodite. <laughs> so, um, like, he's mostly indifferent but he's he's still out there you know like on the field with his spear doing damage taking out humans for no reason other than his his girlfriend likes it <laughs> i mean yeah really it. he's so easy to mess with because he thinks he's above it which is a very abusive dad thing to do they always they always think that like zeus doesn't think that any of his kids are the one who stole the bolt when we know that Ares is the one that catches Luke doing it and goes along with the plan because he thinks it is fun. Yeah, literally. So it's like, literally your child did it. It's just yeah. he, your divine. It never would have worked. If he was against it, they would have, he would have put the stuff back. They would have probably killed Luke and nothing else would have ever happened after that moment. Um, but because Ares w thought it was fun because his dad sucks enough that he doesn't care and thinks it's fun to watch them all fight, everything else happens from that moment going forward. Mm -hmm. um, oh, there's something with, oh, the thing I thought was interesting that kind of, when I think about the next season of the show is Sea of Monsters, 
Um, I thought it was the part when Annabeth and Percy are talking before they get actually into like the part of the ride. Um, and they're watching like Hephaestus's story and all that kind of stuff. Um, especially the part when he's like questioning his mom's decisions really for like the first time. And he's like, he doesn't want to say out loud that like, she didn't want me to be by you guys because she knew that this was like a bad family. And he doesn't want to say that to Annabeth. Um, but that kind of goes in line with like stuff that, that happens in Sea of Monsters and really going forward, but it especially starts being a thing with Percy and Sea of Monsters that um, there's a, a whole storyline in that book and slash I'm sure in the show that he learns about Luke and Thalia and Annabeth when she was younger, like they hide out in one of their places from Luke in the very beginning of the book um, where they hid out when they were kids and he's jealous like he literally says i'm jealous and he's jealous of hearing these stories about annabeth and luke and thalia having this like long-term relationship because percy never has that with like anyone in this world in the same way like he builds relationships obviously with people like the best ones obviously annabeth and grover but like he showed up there when he was 12 he doesn't have like this connection to this world before everything starts going wrong. And so he never really gets a chance to just be like a normal person in this world before everything starts happening. It's like, as soon as he shows up, it's just like all of a sudden all these things start happening and he's just a part of it. And there's a whole thing with him that he always just wants to be able to be a part of like the group in a way, like he just wants to be one of the other kids and feels jealous the fact that Annabeth, even though she went through horrible stuff too as a kid, that she still got that. Like she grew up having people who understood her and he never had that. And it, that's like really, that's really hard for him. And it's a, honestly an abused kid allegory because nobody understands what the hell we're ever doing <laughs> when we're at school. Like I didn't have friends until I was like 15 or something like that. And so it's, it's like, people just don't know how to talk to you when you're an adult in a little child's body. Um, yeah. And it's just that I like that. I thought about that, that that's like a weird way to foreshadow that. However, that happens in Sea of Monsters. I know that it will be in it cause it's too important of a plot point not to include it, but it's just part of Percy's whole thing is like, that's part of like the anger with Luke, I think is like, you got all of these things that I never had and you are throwing them all away to be a murderous monster. Like what the hell is wrong with you? Yeah. I wonder how they'll do that. I wonder if they'll do flashbacks. I am. Um, so the last time they did a season, they started filming in June, which I'm assuming they will this time because they would want to take advantage of the kids being in not in school, like in the summertime. Um, and since this whole season is basically them on boats, like, except for like four yeah, scenes, um, they're going to want like nicer weather as long as they possibly can. And they, the last time they announced who the trio were in like May and that was, and they like, and as more time went on, they like announced as the season was filming the other roles, like they didn't even announce like who Luke was or Clarice at first, they announced those as they started filming those episodes, but it took a while for them to announce all the different parts and stuff. Um, and I know that the kids are in, or at least Walker is in LA right now. He's the only one that doesn't live there all the time. And so I have to assume that they're, that he's there at least to figure out parts for this, for the show. And if they do have Thalia in this season, they'll have to announce it somewhat soon. And I, they might, I, I hope they do. Yeah. Like it would be weird for the actress to, she'll film like a couple flashback scenes and then be in the very last scene of the se of the season probably, and then do nothing else for like another year or something. Um, but I just have to imagine that they will want to because of just, because it just fleshes everything out with not well, especially because in Sea of Monsters, um, 
It's like very pivotal to the storyline. Yeah, yeah, there's a whole even outside of like Luke, they Luke trying to kill them like four times and him specifically trying to kill Percy twice, like aggressively. One one of the times when he tries to kill him, Kronos has to stop him. <laughs> Um, because he obviously just wants to kill him um, <laughs> and is like not doing what Chrono says, which, you know, that's an abusive person. He wants to be the one who is special. So he wants to kill Percy. So he gets to stay special. But even outside of that stuff, um, there's a whole storyline with Annabeth and Tyson in, in Sea of Monsters where she's scared of him because she was tricked by a Cyclops um, oh, when yeah. she was really little. That's how she found like Thalia and Luke is the Cyclops like pretended to be one of their voices and trapped her in this building and she almost died and they almost die like that's um part of how they ended up being attacked the way that they were by like the Furies and stuff when they got to camp but like she's she doesn't she keeps calling Tyson like a monster and she doesn't want to like him because she's scared of him and Percy is like upset at her, obviously, because he's like, that's my brother. And even before he knew about that Tyson was his brother, like, even when he thought that Tyson was just like a disabled, like, homeless person, he befriended him <laughs> at school and was being like bullied by kids at school because they were making fun of him. Um, so he's not going to be okay with Annabeth saying stuff like that. But it's a really interesting story that where Annabeth has to like admit that she's wrong about something and she's just traumatized by this thing that happened to her and that's why she's reacting so strongly to Tyson who is like literally the most precious thing <laughs> Tyson doesn't want to hurt anybody he just wants to help and he's like can I just help my brother please <laughs> and and it, that's literally him that's his role throughout the entire thing he's not he's not like predatory or scary at all um and I just can't see a show whose obvious kind of story is like monsters don't always look like monsters, not like including that as a big thing. Like he technically is a monster, but he's not. Yeah. Like Luke is more monstrous than Tyson has ever even thought about being. Um, but I, I really hope they do that with Annabeth because that's really good character development for her to be like so wrong about something. It because is. she's because of trauma it happens to all of us yeah we've all been there yeah we all uh, do like stupid have have not stupid but like you know have reactions like that because of trauma and we just can't see somebody clearly because we're just scared of them she gets over it pretty quickly so there is that yeah tyson i remember proves himself i remember really loving him but it's been six years or something since i read it so yeah when tyson at some point tyson makes a watch for percy that has like a, a shield on it um so that will probably be in the show at some point i probably season three because i don't think he may, has time to make it in the second season but um but there's a whole point of uh, when they're out in the water that they get attacked by luke again um and uh annabeth and and percy end up on like that's how they end up on like cersei's island mm -hmm. and clarice ends up on the island where polythemus is and grover is and both of them think that the other ones are are dead they all they, they all think that no one else survived but them um but they think that tyson's dead uh they think that tyson sacrificed himself so that they could get away and that's one of those like what is going on with percy's like self like what he thinks about himself moments because that's when he says that he wants to jump into the water and drown himself because he's so upset that tyson sacrificed himself for him like thankfully he's not actually dead yeah. um but he definitely proves himself a lot by the by the end of the story he's like going with um Beckendorf to go work with like the other Hephaestus kids on at like the forges and stuff and is like really excited about that and so I'm mostly just really excited to see who they cast as Tyson yeah it'll be interesting how they pull that off and especially the Cyclops thing like yes. do they choose to make him look like a Cyclops the whole time or do they choose to make him mystified and have like yeah, yeah. Especially because the movie version was fucking stupid. <laughs> like, I watch that's, it, so. 
that's true for like everything with the movies but i never there's um there's this percy podcast called the newest olympian and it's like an adult that's reading the books for the first time and he did a bunch of episodes of him watching the movies and him just like talking about how horrible they are and like i want to listen to those to like laugh and especially the sea of monsters ones because i never watched that movie but i do remember seeing like scenes and clips of tyson in that movie which is part of the reason why i was like yeah i don't think i'm gonna watch this is because they have him be like a stoner kid like he has like dreads he's like a white boy that has like white boy dreads in his hair he's wearing like those um those like hoodies that like all of the like stoner kids like who listen to like fish and oar and stuff would wear and they probably still wear them i don't know how else to describe those <laughs> like you see them at like pack sun or whatever sometimes or like spencer's or whatever but he's like he looks like that and and like some of the time he doesn't have like the one eye but it like i was like how do you how do you how do you see tyson who's like a a homeless like disabled kid who's like a very nice sweet child and turn him into like a white boy with dreads <laughs> yeah they're gonna get it better no matter what if that's how they did it i i, I don't know what to do out. i i in remember seventh grade like yeah. percy's in seventh i get i get like the whole thing with the movies is that they're like actually you know like i don't even know how old they're supposed to be in high school yeah, clearly. Yeah, so there is that part of it too that kind of ruins it. But like, I'm like, they're supposed to be like, he's supposed to be like a homeless child. Like, you're supposed to be mad at Poseidon in that book that Poseidon just like left one of his kids as a homeless kid, just like out there because he just didn't care about taking care of him like that. Um, I guess they don't care if you're a homeless kid when you're in high school. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Sidebar, but like, one of the funniest trends I've seen from Percy Jackson videos are like those the photo videos where the first photo is like Percy or Annabeth being like being like are we always like soulmates in every universe and the second picture is like the adult like from the movies of either Percy or Annabeth being like I'm 35. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, that, no, that, that, no, that's, that won't work. <laughs> um, where was I going with that? Oh yeah. The whole thing with, um, Sally, I just like how they, they have Percy. One of the hardest things when you have a really abusive, uh, parent of some sort, or just an abusive one and a completely like absent one when it comes to him with dads is like acknowledging that the one that's there that seems to show that they love you also can make mistakes mm -hmm. <laughs> that's really really hard and yeah. so i like that they're having him have to think about that and like annabeth like reassures him pretty quickly and makes him feel better about it like no she just didn't want you to be like this but he's definitely like insecure about it of like did my mom not do the right thing like, did she not actually prepare me? Everybody, all these gods think that she didn't. And so is she actually wrong? Um, I don't think that she did the wrong thing there, but it does always leave him kind of on the outside of everything, even though that's what she wanted. It's hard though, when he is in that world that he is still on the outside of everything. And because he's Poseidon's kid, he like never really has a chance to just be like normal. <laughs> All right, so we haven't talked about Grover yet. So <laughs> Grover. Grover in this episode. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, I know your favorite line is the thanks for the emotional abuse and the cheeseburgers. Yeah. It's just the thing I said to you before, which is accurate, is like you we always compare it to like Harry Potter, but it does work. Um, that you were saying that like Ron and Harry Potter. Okay, so JK Rowling based ron and hermione off of her abusive relationship that she was romanticizing because she did not go to therapy and has lots of problems and so because of that ron's kind of 
jokes are very mean spirited. Like when I was reading Harry Potter, I didn't like Ron a lot of the time. I like went back and forth with him because I wanted to like him, but he was so mean to Hermione and to especially to me at the time. Those sort of jokes reminded me of the like backhanded shit that like especially my sister used to say to me all the time. Oh, yeah. And so it just felt way too mean. And I was just like, I hate the idea of the two of them ever getting together. I hated it from like the first book on. And so there's that side of of them, like, like his humor is kind of mean spirited almost. And but with Grover, his humor is not at all like that. And is actually a part of like his empathy, like he uses it to kind of like, disengage like stressful situations whether it's like percy yelling at aries or percy and annabeth or just like when people are scared or whatever he will like make jokes to try to make things better so that everything everyone will get along easier and it just is such a cool part of his like rover's personality that he uses that it's it's kind of this the thing with Aries is always that he um, he thinks that he's smarter than them and he's not. And so whether it's Percy or Annabeth or Grover, he he just like constantly thinks that he's better than than he is and he's not. And so because of that, he does not realize that Grover is not only making fun of him to his face, like right in front right in front of him. But he also doesn't even realize that how easy it is for Grover to manipulate him. Like it's disgustingly easy <laughs> for him to manipulate him. All he has to be like is, you have a sister. Isn't she stupid? <laughs> and he starts like ranting about about Athena's owl for three minutes. And it's just, I love how his humor is such a, a huge part of his character. And it like is that part of him that people mis underestimate him constantly. And they just think that he's just a satyr and he doesn't know what he's doing, but he absolutely knows what he's doing all the time. Yeah, well, I mean, so Tyson, who we were just talking about, and um, Grover would likely face the same kind of discrimination because it's, I mean, this also another Harry Potter kind of thing where they treat the centaurs crappy like because they're half human. Um, cyclopses or semi-human oh my god sorry i just i just had like a harry potter flashback and i just remembered that they have the centaurs like sexually abuse dolores umbridge it's it's not mentioned it's implied with how oh centaurs god. are they are oh very my god in Greek that is just horrific to say that the beings that are basically the disability allegory are like these horrible beings that have no choice but to like act out their urges like that. Wow. Okay. Sorry. Keep going. I just forgot about that until you said that. I mean, well, yeah, but that's also how Greek mythology somewhat treats them because Chiron's supposed to be above the other centaurs. He's not like other centaurs. And I can't really think of a, I guess, I don't know if Pan appears like a, a satyr or not, but I can't think of a satyr example of that one. Um, and then Cyclopes, Polyphemus is supposed to be somewhat like higher tier than the rest of the Cyclopes because he is Poseidon's kid. Mm -hmm. So, um, although all of them are somewhat Poseidon's kids. So yeah, it's, I don't know. they they like portray them as, oh, every once in a while there's a good one and like one that's above them. I think that Grover, um, he probably like he's had to deal with it but at the same time he gets to bond with these heroes one and one one on one and that's putting him in a, a position more like chiron where mm -hmm. it's like i am a big part of these stories and this is this is huge for me although technically he failed but like the one time he was sent out before this yeah that well i was just gonna say that like grover's whole story is so interesting alone in this season like this quest that they're on is so important for him because the only other time he was out there was when Thalia died and was turned into a tree and so he his like searcher's license was revoked after that and this is like them giving him another chance and there's kind of a lot of parallels with I love Grover and Percy so much and 
because I feel like they have a lot of similarities in the way that like Grover is a little bit different from a lot of the other satyrs. Um, he just doesn't want necessarily the, th the same things the same way that they do. Like that is obviously him and it's a part of who he is and all that, but he doesn't necessarily fit in in the way that the other satyrs do. And like, like that's why I think he finds Pan because he isn't like everyone else and is able to have these like really good relationships with Percy and Annabeth, especially Percy, and like think of things that the other satyrs just like wouldn't. Um, but it, he is, he has a lot of pressure on him in this season of like, I can't mess this up, not only because he actually knows Percy and Annabeth really well and doesn't want anything to happen to them, but it's also like, if this quest fails, I'm never gonna be able to, I'm never, they're never gonna let me try to find Pan, they're never gonna let me do anything else ever again. And he just wants to help them. Um, and so he's like kind of, I like how they show him this season kind of trying to balance those two things, like trying to help Percy and Annabeth while also trying to figure things out like he's he's like they're equal and then not at the same time like he's their mentor but then also their friend and he goes kind of back and forth between those two roles all the time and that's not an easy thing to show on screen and I think it's kind of sweet that Aryan who plays him is 16 in the first season while Walker and Leah are 13 yeah. And he kind of does that too. <laughs> like this next season when they film, he'll be 18 and they're still, they're always going to be three years younger than him, obviously. And so I'm sure there is a little bit of that in their friendship too, that he, they're friends, obviously, they act like best friends. They're absolutely ridiculous <laughs> around each other. They make me laugh so much in all of their interviews, but he is older than them and can help them kind of figure things out just life-wise because he's just older than they are. And just like slightly enough that it matters at this age, but it's not going to matter when they're adults. <laughs> no, like it only matters until like pretty much now until they're like 18 or, or whatever. And then after that, it won't matter as much at all. Um, but it does kind of weirdly echo the relationship that he has with Pers that Grover has with Percy and Annabeth, which is just kind of one of those funny things that happened. It's not like they like meant for that to happen, but it just makes the dynamic, I think, more authentic because it's there in both places. Yeah, we do get the nods to his eventual like wanting to seek out Pan and why he wants to. I feel like with you saying, you know, he's he's different than the rest of the satyrs and that's why he's able to do it he genuinely wants nature back like that's that's where his motivation is it's not i want to be the one with the chaos of i am the searcher who found pan it's i want nature back in balance so i am going to go on this quest because that's how you do it yeah, and yes. yeah we see the little nods to it both in medusa still and in the lotus casino which i really appreciate that they kept those in so that it leads us to the next season i really like too how in the fourth episode when they're in the the arch that he gets upset by the manifest destiny stuff and annabeth tries to like explain it away of like oh that's just like human stuff and he's still upset and like percy he somehow when they were in middle school talked about animals enough where percy's like he just gets really upset that when when people are mean to animals like he already knows that about him even before he knew that he was a satyr but i just like that little bit that they put in that that grover isn't there when percy first like collapses when he's poisoned because he's upset at annabeth mm -hmm. for trying to make excuses for animals being killed in a in like a place that's supposed to be a temple for her mom yeah and it's just those like little bits of his it's so much, I don't even know, like, I have to reread all of the books, but I feel like they made Grover's character 57 billion times better than he was in the books. Yeah. That might not be accurate, but I feel like it is. <laughs> I mean, you could do more with it when you have that person on screen, I'm sure. So that's part of it. And yeah, we did get the books from Percy's perspective. So that also limits it. And they really try to do a good job of exploring all angles of the story in the show. And it's, and it's like a thing of like, they don't mention Pan 
at all in the first book. It's just all of a sudden in the second book, oh, Grover's looking for Pan. And you're like, who the heck is that? <laughs> but like on a show where everything is planned out way in advance, they can mention that stuff because it does make a lot of sense to bring it up now. And Grover is 24 years old <laughs> in this season. <laughs> That's one of my funny, the funniest, like, reactions i think of walker is when he's like i'm actually 24 and he's just like i don't know what to do with this information <laughs> you, you look like you're 12. <laughs> but um because he is older like that he is thinking about things that like the 12 year olds wouldn't be thinking about mm -hmm. and i just really like how i just really like him in this show like i'm the thing i always think about is when they get to like the later episodes when they're in like the underworld and he loses um, the pearl and he like, is like, I should stay behind. And they're like, no, like th this isn't your fault. And he's like, I'm I'm your satyr, I'm supposed to protect you. So I should just stay here and you guys can just go. And it's like, no, <laughs> like, who do you think you're talking to? Oh my God, <laughs> like that's never gonna happen. <laughs> but it's just like sweet to see that by that point you expect him to say that because the friendship he has with the two of them has built been built enough. I We're not to the sixth episode yet, obviously, but one of my favorite things in that episode is when he like forgets temporarily who they are. And then he like, when they're looking for the car and, and he asks Percy like, is it my fault that we're late? And he looks like so concerned and Percy's like, no, it's not your fault at all. And he's like, and he's like reassured and it's really just sweet how at the end of the episode he's like you're my best friends like how did i forget about you mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's just i love how i just care so much more about him than i did reading the books and it just makes the relationships the three of them have way way better yeah their relationship is super sweet and yeah it's I feel like the way that the kids have developed together, because watching them in interviews together, you know that they have a bit of that dynamic in real life too. And I love it. Yeah. He's a so good voice. Like the, there's a couple, I, I'm going to see if I can try to find them because they're so funny, but there's a couple interviews where you can just tell that these kids are kids and they're just like bored doing um, press all day. But there's one interview in particular where Leah uh, is asking, answering a question and and like Walker and Arian like cross their legs at like the same time. And she just like starts laughing and forgets what she's saying. And the interviewer is like, what are you guys doing? And they're like, we're not doing anything. And then they both and they you literally see them like Walker give like a signal and they both like cough at the same time. And then in another interview, all three of them like cross their legs at the same time, <laughs> like in synchronicity. And I'm just like, oh my God, they're such teenagers. I love it in like the best possible way. It's just so yeah, funny to watch them do stuff. Like I remember there's this one interview where I watched where they were asking like, oh, how did you guys like get along you guys obviously get along really well um so how did like how did that happen and leah and walker both just like look at arian and he's like oh okay <laughs> like i'm supposed to answer that question <laughs> um but it's just that like authentic sort of stuff you do when you actually get along in real life it's just it's fun to watch them do that yeah yeah um so him manipulating aries that is interesting to watch because he does it in such a subtle way like you said that like Ares does not pick up on it at all and we know Ares is this hot-headed from mythology like mm -hmm. it definitely checks but the fact that Grover knows it enough to just like tiptoe the line enough that we get these funny lines here and there is just perfect yeah like I I and you can tell like I love how um before they even leave when Ares says like he has to stay here and Percy and Annabeth are like, no, like we're not like splitting up. And he's like, I'll be fine. Like he knows Aries enough already to know that he can handle him just fine. And he can try to figure out who the lightning thief is by, but I love the like back and forth of when he would, he says things that might like, that might backfire. And he just kind of sits there and waits. And then he, every time Aries responds the way that he wants him to. And it's just, 
and it's just so fun it's so much fun to watch him because you just think that or Aries at least thinks that he's just like this like he says you eat tofu and you sing songs about nature and animals you're nobody and um like Aries super fucks up in that in that scene like they leave knowing so many things that they should not know like they think that Clarice is the one that has a lightning bolt but either way they leave that like discussion knowing for sure that Aries knows who it is and is working with that person they assume that that's Clarice because she's his like number one kid that's like a at, like we talk about Harry Potter sometimes but like you know in Harry Potter how they just like assume that Snape is the like Snape is the fucking worst like t- like just to say that but but like they but they don't know any of that stuff they just assume that snape is the one that's doing all the bad things because he has like dark hair and hates harry and is mean to him which he is horrible to him but they don't really have a reason besides that to not like snape and so when when the adults are like what are you talking about snape is not the one doing this stuff it like when you're reading it you're like they must be wrong because this is just like the easiest person to pick but like whereas in this one it makes sense that they would think that it's Clarice because who else would Aries like cover up for like they would never assume that Aries would cover up for Luke of all people and so that wouldn't be like the right assumption for them to make and so when they realize that they're wrong they can just like let that go and it doesn't it's not like a big thing like it is in harry potter where it takes 57 million billion years for them to realize that they're wrong about snape in multiple books like they think that clarice is the one that did it in this one book and they have a reason to think it and then as soon as they realize they're wrong they never think that about her ever again (laughs) and so so it would check out that like Ares wouldn't think about who he chooses. He just wants war. He just like wants to have fun fighting. So anybody who's up for it, he's going to side with them just because it means he gets to go out and play with the spear. Yeah, like, oh, is this Hermes? Hermes's kid? Like who, who like the camp all idolizes? Sure. Like, why not? <laughs> like, let's just go with that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just Grover is amazing in this in this in this episode especially those scenes with Aries are so much fun to watch and it's I feel like those I think the reason why I watched I got to the fifth episode and I got on TikTok and just made a TikTok just ranting about how I was like this is one of the best adaptations of a book I've ever seen like since like Lord of the Rings and I still believe that and then finish the rest of the season. But like, I stopped after this episode because I was like, these two storylines are so good. It's ridiculous how good, and like, they kind of weirdly echo each other. Like Grover is more manipulating Ares than Percy is manipulating Annabeth to let him be the one to sacrifice himself. But they both are doing stuff like that. They're both like using what they know about the other person in the room to kind of take advantage of the fact that they don't think that they would be doing that to them to get what they want. And the other person in one situation, Annabeth surprises Percy by not by doing what he doesn't expect, which is like saving him and actually caring about what happens to him. But like Aries just goes along with exactly what they want and gives them exactly what they want. (laughs) And I just, I think it's so funny that he doesn't realize that he that he messed up their whole plan by doing that. Like, sorry, bro. <laughs> uh, what else happens? I'm trying to think how this episode ends. It ends with them leaving the diner, right? Yeah, they leave the diner. They get into, uh, Percy yells at Aries and says, like, watch out. You're going to find out who I am, which he does when he um, beats him in a fight, which is really great. And, <laughs> um, but they get on that's when they like get on the thing and that the end of the episode is basically Grover saying I know who stole the lightning bolt and that's like where it ends and then with the animals <laughs> and that's like where it ends um but yeah there's just so many good little things in this in this episode that it's like I've watched it a lot because it's just a lot of the the storylines are very satisfying to watch um, it just gives you such a good insight into kind of what they're going for in this on this show and how they see the world. Yeah, it 
it very much that episode like if you have if I had to pick my favorite episode of the season that would definitely be top like <laughs> there's so much going on with it that's great yeah like the the tunnel of love stuff is ridiculous um both Percy and Annabeth say ridiculous speeches to each other like Percy saying you're better at this than me and admitting like I don't believe in fate but I guess I'm the one that needs to sacrifice myself um and Annabeth's speech of being like no this person is like ugh. I just love so much that she realizes that like this world needs somebody like Percy mm -hmm. and help basically from that moment on does whatever she needs to do to protect him so that he can stay safe in this world that doesn't want him to be there um and but that's very much what's going on it's just so nice to see that happened while also watching Grover just make a fucking fool <laughs> out of especially it's especially nice because um after like re-looking at Sea of Monsters stuff seeing like remembering that re-remembering that scene with Clarice where Ares like literally threatens to hit her mm -hmm. and is threatening her and is like saying like i should have just given this to somebody else why did i give this to you um and just being like i think the thing i said to you is like why is aries acting like my dad did rick riordan meet my dad like but like everything that aries says in this in this episode reminds me of the things that my dad would have said to me um so it's like wild to watch a god act like that but also be put in his place it's like really satisfying to watch an actually abusive, like canonically, like physically abusive God be made a fucking fool out of two 12 year olds and a 24 year old satyr. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and for all of the people who think that they're not scared enough of him, I mean, it is just part of the reality that Ares is so hot headed that he gets himself in trouble. So you can outsmart him super easily. And uh, they, they are still scared of him like every time like the time when like when like Grover brings up like Athena and then when he brings up like liking wars and stuff mm -hmm. there's these moments these like tension moments where like the camera is like right in his face where you can like feel like that tension where he's afraid of him and he's afraid of if Ares is gonna get turn on him and do something to him and it doesn't end up that way but um like Aries is literally like that like attack dog basically that you constantly have to like keep on like a leash all the time because you don't know what else he's going to do because he doesn't he doesn't care he doesn't like the part <laughs> the part in this episode when he's saying that the his least favorite day of the year is when he sees his kids and that he hates all of his kids. He hates all children, but he, his kids are a little bit better, but he hates all of them. He doesn't want to ever see any of them on the winter solstice. Like he hates his kids so much. I was like, why, why are you my dad? Like, can you stop? Like my, I'm sure, I'm sure that my dad said shit like that about like, at least about me when I wasn't there. Um, and it's just like, why are you so horrible? Like you are literally, the worst of everything like you're the most abusive god and you're also a god so you're also ridiculous in the way that gods are in this world and then on top of it you're also horrible in the way that humans can be horrible mm -hmm. and it's just like the juxtaposition i guess like watching him sit there and laugh while per when percy is watching his stepdad say that he thinks that he murdered his mother and that the he's like he thinks it's so funny that the FBI is going after Percy because they think that he murdered his mom. He and it's like, <laughs> like, why is this funny to you? Like, and you know that he's like the God of war, but it's even like, he's depraved in like a special way. Like, I think that it's so funny that, um, that in when Percy loses all of his memories, that the one of the things he remembers Annabeth and he remembers that he fucking hates Aries. When like the Roman version of Ares shows up, he just starts insulting him and saying that he smells bad. 
and stuff like that. And the other kid is like, oh my God, what are you, what are you doing? And, he, and they like, they think that he's insulting gods because he doesn't have his memory. And it's like, no, he's always like this. <laughs> He's never been scared of them. <laughs> like he, especially with Aries, he's going to be like that, especially. Um, but I just, yeah, that that would be the god that Percy hates the most. <laughs> of course, yeah. He deserves it. So, yeah. All right. Well, I I think we've talked about everything there is for this episode, and then is episode six the Lotus Casino one? Mm-hmm. That yeah. one should be interesting because the way that they do it in the book is very different. So there's a lot to like compare about that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we'll talk about Lotus Eaters next week, but there's not a ton to go off of and they could have they could put it any way they want to really. There's so many different interpretations you could go with with that. So yeah, putting it in the air in the casino is an interesting one. We'll talk yeah. about that next week though. Yeah. All right, um, I'm going to go have some really late lunch. <laughs> okay. All right. Talk Bye. to you later. Bye.